And I began to look around me and in my city of Allahabad, in a secular university, I realized that every good things in my city had come from the Bible. Uh, that included my mother tongue, Hindi, that included uh, my university, it included uh, the civil lines, the banking system, the agricultural institute, the university, the education, um, healthcare, uh, municipality, democracy, everything in my city had come from the Bible. And that's what began to see that, okay, if this is the book that has already blessed India, then I must study it. Welcome to Reenchanting, the podcast from Seen and Unseen. You can find us at the website seenandunseen.com for Christian perspectives on just about everything. I'm Justin Briley. And I'm Belle Tindall. And we are bringing you a very special guest today. Uh, we'll be introducing him in just a moment's time. But if you're listening via podcast, please do rate and review the show. It helps others to discover Reenchanting. And of course, if you can subscribe and like on YouTube, that also helps people to discover the show. Yeah, believe it or not, we are approaching the finish line for season one of Reenchanting. And last but not least in this season is Vishal Mangalwadi, a social reformer who's been described as India's foremost Christian intellectual. He's the author of books including The Book That Made Your World, How the Bible Created the Soul of Western Civilization, and The Book That Changed Everything, The Bible's Amazing Impact on Our World. Yeah, so we'll be talking to Vishal about how he believes the Bible has shaped the West and his home country of India and why he believes the Bible is the key to re-enchanting culture today. So welcome along to the show, Vishal. Thank you very much for having me. And I really appreciate your initiative. Oh, thank mm. you so much. Well, normally we record this show at the top of Lambeth Palace Library in London. And because of that, we always ask our guests this opening question. What are you currently reading at the moment, Vishal? Well, I have been uh, traveling a lot to Canada, uh, Germany and Croatia. So I've had very little energy to read. <laughs> and therefore, most of my reading is actually for a change, uh, listening to videos. I keep track of James Webb uh, Space Telescope yeah. and mm. all the interpretations that are coming. But a lot of my listening has been about uh, what's happening in India. Um, so I'm keeping up with the political news in India and um, the news of persecution, etc. cetera. So, um, so I do spend a few hours a day, but most of it has been listening rather than reading. Mm. Um, mm. This is partly because I'm trying to do six or seven books. You know, some of these are old books during the next two months which uh, i have so i'm reading my own things and editing them <laughs> um when it comes to the books that you have written obviously some of your best known books are are on the subject of the bible and i wondered grow, growing up in india when did you first run into the bible do you have any memories of first hearing or, or reading the bible yourself Michelle? yes uh, as a in in the 19, I guess it was 69, that uh, I was studying philosophy and I began to feel that I could not believe what my pastors were saying, that the Bible is God's word, uh, because none of my professors, who seemed to be more learned than my pastors, none of them believed the Bible. Uh, so I decided that I cannot believe the Bible. The doubting the Bible was very easy, but the question was, what then do you believe? And uh, that, uh, I decided that I'll believe what the best philosophers and scientists believe, and what do they believe? And as I began to review my whole course, I took about six months in reviewing my course in philosophy and came to realize that philosophers knew that they did not know the truth and that they could not know the truth. And that's what triggered my interest in seeing that is there someone who knows the truth and who has revealed it to us? 
uh, is, is there a word from God? Um, so I began looking at first Hindu scriptures, then Muslim scriptures, and then finally the Bible, mainly because of my older sister who said that you should read the Bible. And I said that I have read the Bible and it's childish stories. <laughs> so she said, no, 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 you were a child when you read the Bible. Uh, in, <laughs> now you think you're a philosopher, so you should read it critically. So, the, so it was uh, at that time about nineteen. Uh, yeah, the, I, I was twenty by then. I began to read the Bible, and I found Genesis exciting because it was answering questions that philosophy had not answered. And I found Genesis and Exodus very interesting. Leviticus very boring. <laughs> And yeah. then when I came to Judges and Ruth, I found it, the Bible morally repulsive. And when I came to the um, historical books of Kings and Chronicles, and then I thought that the Bible was a very boring book, a long list of kings who did evil in the sight of the Lord and he killed them. And nobody told me that modern political freedoms actually come from those boring books because they were the ones that told Western scholars how nations should not be governed and how God wants nations to be governed. So uh, nobody told me, but it took a long time to realize that these are the books that have actually created modern India and the modern world. Uh, and therefore, I've been exploring that topic mm. and writing about it. So my background is in theology, so I'm enjoying this chat already. <laughs> what are we? Four minutes in and I'm already <laughs> delighted. <laughs> um, but was there, you know, you say um, you noticed that you were sort of looking at the world and you noticed that the um, political systems and things like that came from the Bible. Was there a moment that you can remember either within the biblical narrative or within society that that clicked for you? Was there a specific click there? Yes, um, it, it was reading Kings and Chronicles and seeing all the political evil that Kings did evil in the sight of the Lord and he killed them that first I found very boring and I decided that this is not for me. I'm going to close the Bible once and for all. Mm. I'm an Indian. I don't know enough about Indian history. Why am I reading this Jewish history? And as I was ready to close the Bible once and for all, it suddenly struck me that Indian history is always praising Indian kings. They're how good and glorious and wonderful they were. And this book is a Jewish book and it's condemning Jewish kings. So obviously this is not court history. Kings didn't pay historians to write about their fathers. So I thought it must be religious history. Uh, that priests wrote it to criticize the politicians. Because in India, uh, the Brahmins, the priestly class, and the ruling class, the Kshatriyas, uh, are often up against each other. So the religious leaders wrote this book to condemn the political leaders. So I began to just confirm, to confirm my thesis that this is the point of view of the religious Jews. I began reading those boring books again and I, to my astonishment, I found that they are saying that the religious system was rotten. It, God says that your religious deeds are like filthy rags through Isaiah. And uh, uh, the God destroyed his own temple. So I thought that, well, in that case, this has got to be the point of view of the prophet. Uh, a prophet is someone who loves to hate everybody. So they're criticizing everyone. So I began looking again. Uh, I, I know that these, these, these are very boring books, but I'm within <laughs> two months reading them for the fifth time. And I find that, in fact, these books are saying that the majority of the prophets were false prophets. They were misleading the nation. The good ones were the losers. They tried to save their nation. They couldn't save themselves. But their books are included because eventually, after Daniel, Daniel himself is inspired by Jeremiah's prophecy that, yes, Israel will be destroyed, Jerusalem will be destroyed, and it will be rebuilt after 70 years. So um, then I uh, uh, 
began to see that the words of these prophets that are included in these books are in fact, it turned out to be true and became the foundation for rebuilding the nation. So the, uh, the question was that the books actually are claiming that this is God's interpretation of Jewish history. It's not the Jewish interpretation. So even if that is true, why should I as an Indian be re reading God's interpretation of Jewish history? That's when uh, my scales fell and I realized that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they were called not because they were good, great, wonderful people, because through them, God wanted to bless all the nations. Uh, so God said to Abraham, you follow me and I will bless India. I will bless all the nations through your offspring. Mm. So has God done this? Uh, is this really God's word that he will bless India or England or Africa uh, through Abraham's descendants? And I began to look around me and in my city of Allahabad, in a secular university, I realized that every good things in my city had come from the Bible. Uh, that included my mother tongue, Hindi. That included uh, my university. It included uh, the civil line, the banking system, the agricultural institute, the university, the education, um, healthcare, uh, municipality, democracy. Everything in my city had come from the Bible. And that's what began to see that, okay, if this is the book that has already blessed India, then I must study it. And uh, it was then when I began this investigation, I found uh, that uh, modern India is a creation of the Bible. And I'd love to come back. There's so much to potentially unpack there. Mm -hmm. I mean, just you know, the starting point you made about, you know, that your language Hindi came from the Bible, that doesn't sound, you know, at first glance, like, 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 like you know, you, you wonder how that can be, but we'll come back to that. Before we get into some sure. of the theses that, that you've mentioned there, though, in the way the Bible has shaped India and the rest of the world, tell us a bit about yourself, because um, you've already mentioned, I guess, this, this encounter with the Bible as a young man, that I guess was as you were starting to take Christianity seriously, um, you, 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 but you, you kind of really have been at the forefront of social reform in your life as well in India, and that even ended up in prison. Tell us a bit about that and and what the situation was like for you in in that at that time, and likewise how the situation continues to be for Christians today in India. Yeah, well, once I r realized that the Bible is actually God's word, and I should live according to it. Uh, the God's heart for the poor and the oppressed, uh, because that's how the Bible really opens in Exodus, that Israelites are slaves. They are crying out against slavery. And God sends a deliverer that slaves can become a great nation in a land flowing with milk and honey, with shalom, liberty, peace, justice, uh, that God has a heart for the poor. And that's what Jesus said, that as a Messiah, he has come to set the captives free. A bruised reed he will not break. A flickering flame he will not quench until he establishes justice on earth. So the kingdom of God is justice on earth. The justice and righteousness are the pillars and foundation of God's kingdom. So that's what Christianity is all about. And that inspired me and my wife to go and serve the poor. We were married in 75. Six months later, we went to a farm that my father had bought when I was born. And uh, we began to, to live there and uh, understood. I was writing my book, The World of Gurus at that time. Uh, but uh, we be also trying to understand poverty and what can we do. So out of that grew our service to the poor. And in 1980, uh, there was a hailstorm which destroyed wheat crop in about 100 villages and also uh, the roofs for the, of the poor because the poor people made handmade tiles, uh, uh, fire bait, uh, not machine made, and they put those on thatched roof 
and the hailstorm broke those uh, tiles. So people were really suffering and crying because uh, all the money that they had borrowed, now they could not return. So as we began our service to the victims of hailstorm, uh, I'll not go into the details of the story, but I was thrown in prison. Um, and it, the superintendent of police, a very educated police officer, who had taken the oath to uphold the Constitution of India, which guarantees my fundamental right to life. He told me that if you do not cancel the prayer meeting for the relief that you have called, I will personally kill you. I don't need to arrest you. I won't. I don't need a warrant. I'll come to your home, pick you up from your home, take you into the jungle, shoot you. Hyenas will eat you. Uh, are you going to cancel this prayer meeting? So I responded that, well, I have to ask my wife if she's okay being a widow, uh, then I can decide whether to cancel the prayer meeting or not. Um, it's The conflict had been going on for about a week. So he sent me back home, being sure that my wife wouldn't want to be a widow. But anyway, we decided that we cannot cancel the prayer meeting because they've already stopped our work relief work, uh, all that we are saying is that victims should come together and pray. Maybe the government itself will do the relief work and we wouldn't have to do it. So when I, when I was, they didn't kill me because the local press was supporting me, but it was in jail that I began to raise this question of how do you build a society where the police is there to protect you not to kill you, uh, where the politicians, a criminal politician was putting pressure on them, and the criminal politician was supported by Hindu religious leaders who felt that our service will lead to many Hindus becoming Christians. And that was the background. So uh, how do you build a society where the oppressed are free? to choose their religion. They're free to pray. And the prayer meeting, the particular prayer meeting they wanted us to cancel was not a sectarian Christian prayer meeting in a church. This was the local Gandhi ashram, state-funded Gandhi ashram had invited us to hold a public meeting as Mahatma Gandhi used to organize public prayer meetings, uh, just getting the victims to pray for relief. So uh, how do you create a free society that was the um, question that triggered some of these studies and inquiries that how do you reform India? But right now in India, uh, there's state-sponsored persecution happening in the northeastern state of um, Manipur, where almost 370 churches and church-related buildings have been burned. 30,000 Christians are homeless at least 75 Christians have been killed. And uh, so uh, how, how do you build nations? And this kind of engagement uh, did earn me the title of being a social reformer. Uh, but of course, I've been studying how was England reformed um, and how was uh, the mm. Europe reformed and America, etc. cetera. Mm. It's, 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 and the idea is to take these lessons from European history to the world. Mm. And you said uh, that question, how do you build a state where people are, you know, you've spoken about the Bible being um, for justice, righteousness, compassion, peace, wholeness, all of those things. What about critics of the Bible who actually equate it more with um, immorality? I saw the BBC news, they, uh, they reported that this week in Utah it's been banned in certain primary schools for its violence. Um, but you've given your whole life, you know, it's your life's work to sort of say the opposite, to show the opposite. Um, can you tell us why that has become so important to you? Uh, yes. In the USA, it was Thomas Paine um, who wrote the first frontal attack on the Bible 
Uh, it, it was published as The Age of Reason, but it was published in three parts. 1805 was the final uh, part of The Age of Reason, which was showing the Bible is full of contradictions, absurdities, immoralities, etc. And mm. people like Richard Dawkins and all have been highlighting that the God of the Bible is a monster. Okay, so you reject the Bible as has America and Europe. Oh, what are you going to put in its place? This is where the Great Books Project of Encyclopedia Britannica became important. Uh, Mortimer Edler grew up as a non-observant Jew. At the age of 14, he started reading Aristotle and then Aquinas. And uh, he teamed up with Robert Hutchins, the president of Chicago University, and Encyclopedia Britannica paid them create the great books of Western civilization. This was the humanist canon. That's, let's reject the Jewish uh, Christian canon of the Bible. and Let's choose the best and the greatest books of Western civilization. And they created this uh, initially 54 volumes, which became 60 volumes of all the great literature from the West. Now, that project went into complete shambles by 1980s because Mortimer Adler, who had grown up as a liberal Jew, uh, himself converted to Episcopalian faith uh, at the age of 84. Adler realized that the if you rely on the humanist wisdom, the best of humanist literature, you have a lot more contradiction. And this is where Alan Bloom's book, who was also in Chicago teaching for 40 years, so Adler and Hutchins and William James, uh, the, these were uh, important philosophers in Chicago University. Uh, so was Alan Bloom. And in 1987, he published Closing of the American Mind. And he pointed out that 40 years ago, when he went into sh Chicago University uh, as a teacher, uh, students wanted to study great books of Western civilization, great music, great arts, great architecture. But by the 1980s, as he was read, uh, preparing to retire, students were not interested in Western uh, literature, uh, Western classics. Parents were not interested in their children wasting their time with humanist wisdom. University was not interested in teaching the great books. Uh, why not? He gives two reasons. One, all the great literature of the West is, in fact, based upon the Bible. If you don't know the Bible, you can't understand Milton or um, even Isaac Newton, but Dickens or Bunyan. Uh, uh, you can't understand these great writers, great artists. You can look at Rembrandt's painting of the prodigal son. It'll make mm. no sense to you if you don't know the Bible. So you can't understand Bach or Beethoven or anybody else. You can, can't understand music uh, or architecture of the West if you don't know the Bible. But the second reason which Alan um, Bloom points out is that it is the openness, so-called openness, which means the relative truth, that let's look at everybody, let's look, everyone has their own truth, this openness is what has closed the American mind. This is the heart of Ellen Bloom's thesis, that everybody is true when they're completely opposite to each other, uh, means that nobody has the truth. If nobody has the truth, why should I bother studying them? So the rejection of the Bible has actually closed the Western mind. It's funny you mention Alan Bloom because uh, I've got a quote from him here. Um, and I think he said words to the effect that, you know, if you didn't have the Bible, you would need a book of equal seriousness, you know, to replace it, as you said. And and it that project sort of failed, didn't it? Um, I think he also said the Bible is not the only means to furnish a mind, but without a book of similar gravity, read with the gravity of a potential believer, it will remain unfurnished. I suppose the next question is what what are we losing as we as we f fail to read the Bible any longer? I mean, is it just that our cultural references go that we don't realize that the Milton, the Shakespeare, and everything else was based on the Bible? What 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 else do we lose uh, as as we lose well, that familiarity with the Bible? Well, the people who have uh, been discarding the Bible have actually been sowing 
sawing off the branch on which the whole of the Western civilization was sitting. So, and this is what um, uh, had been understood by the end of the First World War, that we are actually sawing off the branch on which we are sitting, and down we came, and at the bottom was not a bed of roses, but barbed wires. So it is not the Bible that is disintegrating, but it is the Western civilization, the secular atheistic mindset, which is uh, making a fool of itself and disintegrating uh, the Western civilization. Because as Tom Holland is pointing out, uh, that the humanists boast of relying on human wisdom, but Every good thing that they talk about, the dignity of man, the human rights, etc., actually comes from the Bible. This is the same thing with Jordan Peterson. So what happened to Mortimer Edler, uh, realizing that all the great ideas in the West came from the Bible, and you reject the Bible, uh, you have actually destroyed yourself, not the Bible, because yes, the branch was cut off, uh, but the tree will bear um, new branches. New branches will sprout and flower and fruit. Oh, what would be destroyed is Western civilization, not the Bible. Mm. Speaking of it being a branch on which we sit, your thesis is that it's also a branch on which modern India sits. And, you, you know, so if we circle back to a few of the things you mentioned earlier, could you talk us through a little bit of that, particularly perhaps the language, um, the story of that and where this thesis has come from, that uh, Christianity undergirds so much of modern India? Because that, I imagine, to some of our, well, most of our listeners will be something that they have not heard before. That's not a thesis that I've come across before. So it's really interesting. Yes. Well, thank you. Sure. First of all, the name India. The name India comes from Latin Bible, from the book of Esther. Um, uh, twice the book of Esther mentions India as the last province of the Persian Empire. Yeah. So uh, when uh, Columbus uh, starts the, the sea route to India, uh, nobody in India thinks of it himself as an Indian. We are part of the Mughal Empire. There are a few other kingdoms. Uh, Columbus, of course, gets stuck in South America. Why are American Native Americans Indians? Why were 200 years later Native Australians called Indians? Why is Indian uh, Indonesia, Indian Asia? Uh, so wherever Europeans were going, they were finding India uh, yeah. <laughs> because no geographic entity or political entity called India ever existed. Right. Uh, the, the, uh, the, so it was the European mind that was fascinated by India because reading the Bible, they assumed that India was the end of the world. When you have reached India, you have reached the end of the world. So first of all, the very name India, when Vasco da Gama finally arrives in southern India, in uh, Calicut in Kerala, uh, no, no one calls himself an Indian. Um, it's the, the idea of India existed in Western mind because of the Bible. And it is William Carey, who uh, I've just completed the book, The Father of Modern India, a British cobbler uh, who is really the father of modern India. Who, he begins the linguistic revolution uh, because of which finally Hindi becomes the dominant language of India. Uh, but uh, Hindi, Hindi came out of Hindustani, which was a, a Scottish uh, surgeon uh, with the British East India Company, um, uh, he was told that Persian is India's official language. He traveled from Calcutta all the way to Farukkabad, the Faisabad, Faisabad, I guess, and he found that nobody in India actually speaks Persian. Yes, the Mughals, who were not Persians, had made Persian the court language of India. The two other class classical languages 200 years ago in India were Arabic, the language of Quran and Islam, and Sanskrit, the language of Brahmins. 
But Brahmins wouldn't teach Sanskrit to their own wives. Uh, Sanskrit had no script. Uh, let alone, it was a sophisticated language. It had a grammar, which was written in poet, poet, poetry, but it had no uh, written script. So these were the three classical languages. And therefore, as uh, the, the Scottish surgeon begins to travel uh, on foot, he realizes that th th this is all myth, that Persian is India's language. And he decides that Hindustani is India's language. And he creates modern Hindustani, out of which Henry Martin, who comes from Cambridge, Henry Martin in Kanpur uh, creates Urdu which is the state language of Pakistan now. So Urdu came out of Hindustani. In reaction to that, then Hindi was born in Allahabad and Varanasi. Allahabad is my hometown. And it was an American Presbyterian missionary, Reverend S.R. Kellogg, who really created modern Hindi grammar. And it was another Presbyterian missionary in Varanasi, Reverend E. Greaves, who uh, popularized Devanagari script. So all of Indian languages, the vernaculars being transformed, was work of Bible translators. That linguistic revolution is what began with Martin Luther in Europe. All of the modern European languages were product of Bible translators. So are all of the Indian languages, over 100 languages, have been, these are vernacular dialects that have been turned into literary languages by Bible translators. You can't be a priest of king uh, and king uh, managing God's kingdom if you don't know God and if you don't know his word. That's a, a, a reformation of priesthood and kingship of all believer is what transformed Europe, uh, starting with the linguistic uh, revolution and education revolution that every child ought to be taught. So 500 years ago, there were no schools in England. There were no schools in Germany. There were mm -hmm. universities, but no schools. Uh, the, the Whatever literacy, et cetera, was happening, was happening in monasteries and nunneries. Uh, it was the, uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church had invented the institution of the university, but the universal education came from the biblical theology of priesthood and kingship mm. of all believers. And that revolution was uh, came to India from uh, with the British missionaries, particularly it's, it's, starting with William Carey. It's just a fascinating sort of history of, of the way that, as you say, the Bible and especially the Bible translation project from the Reformation onwards obviously impacted not only Europe, but, but eventually India through those missionaries and Bible translators. I mean, at a moral level as well, you, you talk about the way the Bible and Christianity has influenced India as well. Um, you, you talk about some of the practices that are now outlawed, but but which were common, um, infanticide, widow burning and so on, Sooty. Um, do you want to just talk about the way that those aspects of India, you know, culture in that part of the world have, have been impacted by the witness of the Bible and so on? This lowering of the status of woman in India was um, fe fe uh, resulted in female infanticide. The fe uh, girls would be killed. Um, and we, Ruth and I, began to struggle against female in infanticide ourselves. So we've had first-hand experience of fighting against this evil. But then uh, a woman if once she's married and uh, she was married as a child so in 1987 there was an 18 year old widow who was forced to commit uh, uh, burn herself on her husband's funeral pyre and i went and wrote that study that was actually uh, th that about that uh, episode which became frontline uh, uh, story in 11 a chain of 11 newspapers in india and began to dominate so it, it, that's when I discovered William Carey is the man who uh, began fighting against widow burning in uh, 19, 1806, uh, 1803 perhaps was the first time when he saw the widow burning and he began to research this issue and it was abolished by 1829. And uh, then 
uh, it took a, a, a 25 years or so to fight against widow burning uh, before the uh, practice was outlawed. Uh, but it was being revived in the 1980s as the influence of the Bible was weakening. And, uh, and I, I, I had to do a lot of work. Uh, and that's how actually my first, uh, the, the book on Indian history began with that episode. Uh, now I've just completed this week the book called The Father of Modern India, William Carey who was mainly responsible for both uh, fighting against female infanticide and widow burning, but he also began the linguistic revolution that created all of modern Indian languages. And um, the concept of India as a nation came from his paper, Friend of India. So he, uh, he became a friend of India while British colonial rulers were looting India the missionaries came as friends of India to build modern India. And that's what the Bible began to do, that God has uh, chosen his church to go into all the world, to bless all the nations, bring healing to all the nations. So the missionary interest and colonial interest collided. They also partnered together because the uh, colonial rulers were there. But basically, uh, it was the Bible-believing Christians in England who created the modern Indian civil services, the police force, the judicial system, uh, agriculture. So William Carey himself established in 1820 the Agri-Horticultural Society in Calcutta. So, uh, and I can go on, that every good thing in India came from the people who loved the Bible, and began sought to uh, uh, um, in, apply that to India. They also fought against British exploitation. So the, the they changed the character of East India Company from being an a just a force that was initially, of course, they were just merchants. But later, once they acquired political power. Uh, they began to take bribes and they began to exploit and uh, legislate rules which were against Indians' economic interest. And this was began to be changed under the influence of the Bible. So the, the British uh, evangelicals transformed East India Company. And then they began the social reform movement within India that created modern India. So, yes. Female infanticide and widow burning were both, uh, William Carey was the key figure in abolishing both of them. And Ruth and I struggled against both of these practices in the 1980s. And that's what, uh, particularly the opposition, my opposition to revival of widow burning was what led to the, gov the parliament under Mr. Rajiv Gandhi uh, enacting stronger rules against widow burning would you would i would it be fair to say then that the um the motivations william Carey's motivations around abolishing things like infanticide and widow burning they are what we in the west assume are just is just common sense universal human rights the dignity of every human but actually what you've identified is that that's a inherently judeo-christian biblical notion and that's where that came from Absolutely. Uh, it is not common sense that men and women are equal. No culture has ever seen uh, male and female as equal. Islam allows a man to marry four women uh, because men and women are not equal. A woman is not allowed to marry four husbands. In Hinduism, a soul reincarnates as a female because her poor karma in previous life. So equality of male and female has never been self-evident anywhere in the world. It was not self-evident in the USA either uh, when the, uh, the Declaration of Independence says we hold these truths to be self-evident that mm. all men are created equal. That is absolute nonsense. 
because <laughs> in 1776, it was not self-evident to average American that slaves and slave owners are equal. It was not self-evident to every American that male and female are equal. That's why female lib, uh, women's lib movement had to begin in America because women experienced themselves as unequal in America uh, 150, 200 years after the Declaration of Independence. So equality of male and female, equality of all human beings, these are theological ideas. They are not self-evident ideas. And this is what Tom Holland is pointing out, that you borrowed these ideas from the Bible and you take the credit uh, that, oh, our brains invented this idea that male and female are equal and all human beings are equal. These ideas depend on the truth that God made man in his image, male and female. The Bible is the seed which uh, the kingdom of God comes when the sower sows the seed. The truth is sown and it takes time for the seed to bear fruit. Uh, particularly a crop can be harvested within six months or four months. But when you plant a tree, uh, the seed takes a long time to germinate. And poorer the quality of the soil, longer it takes for the seed mm -hmm. to germinate and then to bear flowers and branches and fruit. You, you yourself actually said you, you hope that the Bible, as it has revived the West in the past, could do so again. How do you think we could see that kind of re-enchantment of that Christian vision that comes from Genesis onwards? I don't know, emerge again in, in our culture, even as, because the, that, that question, and we've asked this of Tom Holland as well, is can you keep those fruits without the roots? You know, as we cut off the our our kind of familiarity with the Christian story, do do we retain those those intrinsic ideas of human dignity and so on. So, so where where do we go in in the absence of that? Well, th that is uh, obviously the important question, and uh, the first part of the question Jesus answered in in his parable, the second parable of the sower, that a man sowed good seed in his field, but when the seed sprouted, there were also weeds, and. Uh, how did this happen? Didn't we sow good seed? And uh, the master said, well, the enemy did it at night. So there is another power that is active in this world and sows the false seeds. So the, the servants asked, should we pull out the weed? And the master said, no, you must tolerate. Tolerance is important. Let both grow. There will be judgment, but until the final judgment, the sinners will persecute the saints. That's what's happening in Utah, where the foolish education is saying the children should not be taught the Bible. That's intolerance. So uh, the sinners will persecute the saints. Saints must love and serve sinners share the truth with them. Their hearts are also soils. You plant the truth of God's word and the time will come and they will accept the truth. This conflict continues until the end. There will be in the end a final judgment because there is a transcendent God who is on the throne and who will assert uh, his, uh, his kingdom established uh, his kingdom, which which has begun. So uh, how do we change uh, the future is your question. Well, all of modern Europe and modern India was created by the idea uh, of the uh, education that Jesus came to bear witness to the truth. He baptized the church with the spirit of truth. He sent the church out to disciple nations. In a, uh, a disciple is a learner. A disciple maker is a teacher. The church's role is to disciple, which means the church's role is to educate the nation. That's why the church began to educate everyone. And in England, as you travel around in every village, you see that there was the parish, the church, and the parish school. 
mm -hmm. uh, where the priest was in charge of educating the child. This was the implication of Luther's, Luther began the second education revolution, the church should educate. Now, uh, in Europe, it was after 1832, after Napoleon, that the church surrendered ministry of education to the state. I'm not sure when this happened in England, uh, but I have studied a little more about America. So the answer to your question, what do we do? Uh, the solution is simple, that the church has to take education back from the state. State is not an institution baptized with the spirit of truth. The church is baptized with the spirit of truth. Church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. The church in Europe has, and in America has abdicated its responsibility to disciple nations. And it has become too individualistic that we are here to save individual souls, take them to heaven. Discipling nations, discipling United Kingdom is not our job. Uh, we are a pluralistic society. Yes, of course, you are a field in which uh, the seed planted by the Satan and seed planted by God both have to grow. You have to tolerate. Tolerance is one of the greatest gifts that biblical Christianity brought to Europe. So when uh, everything that John Locke wrote in his letter concerning toleration, every good argument came from Martin Luther. Uh, he quoted Martin Luther, but the, the humanists wouldn't acknowledge that uh, the Luther is the source of tolerance in England, in, in America, in all over Europe, as well as in India, that it was the Bible that brought tolerance. So yes, we must tolerate, but state as an institution which is not baptized with the spirit of truth, that's not to say that everything the church says and believes is true. But it is church's job to seek truth, to repent when it is teaching falsehood and to uh, believe, to seek what is truth, bear witness to the truth. This is church's job. So the solution is for the church to take education back. And in our proposal for the third education revolution, we are proposing that every little church in every village in in uh, in England can become a university better than Oxford and Cambridge. Because a church can have 15 students coming to the church, but 15,000 professors can come to the church every day online. And these would be experts from all over the world who can come into the church and students have an option to choose what to study. So. Yes, for financial reasons, historical reasons, we have the system of education that we have today, but to, uh, now technology makes it possible for every little church to become a university better than Oxford and Cambridge. And that's the education revolution that has to come into the world. Uh, because now you have universities, uh, professors who are lost, uh, who, who do not know what truth is. And universities are no longer interested in truth. They are no longer interested in character development. It is church's job uh, to make sure that in every child, the image of Christ is formed. The godly character is the responsibility of the church. So uh, we're, we're proposing a third education revolution, which will change the future. It's going to be hard in England. But let it begin in Africa and Asia and South America. England will have to follow. Mm. Oh, Vishal, I um, I imagine our listeners are going to scream at me at this point because you present a view of the world that is so interesting and so unique. And I think will be quite new to many people. So I'm sure they'll be finishing this podcast with a hundred questions. Um, but for that, I'll direct them to all of your work, your books. Sure. And, and, <laughs> but uh, thank I, you. I am considering of coming to England in October, and it would be good to have a session. Oh, um, there you uh, go. Yeah. Tom, yeah. Tom Holland and I. Tom Holland and I debated on uh, on one Zoom session whether democracy came from Greece or from the Bible. Okay. <laughs> and, 
And in so, that one hour, he, he confessed three times that he hadn't actually studied the history of freedom. Right. So, <laughs> there you go. So round two might there happen in London Maybe. in the autumn. But for now, yes. we should say thank you. Thank you very much for your time and for your passion and your uh, and your wealth of knowledge. Um, thank you so much for joining us on the Reenchanting Podcast. Thank you for having me. It is explosive, uh, but it is a revolution. 